Today's lecture is just a brief introduction to microbiology. So microbiology is the study of microorganisms or microbes that are invisible or naked to the eye. Now, we have a lot of different kinds of microbes out there, uh, bacteria, archaea, fungi, proteists, and helminths. And please know for your exam that helminths are parasitic worms. So as I go through the PowerPoints, anything that's in red is something that you definitely want to be studying. We're also going to talk about viruses and prions and a few other things uh, throughout the semester. Now, it's very important, guys, because in healthcare you're going to be exposed to a lot of different things. And it's also important for agriculture, industry, uh, and environmental sciences. And humans rely on microbes for a lot of different things, like food production, making medication, and breaking down things in the environment. So, two terms to know, pathogen and opportunistic pathogen. Pathogens are microbes that cause disease. Now, opportunistic path pathogens will cause disease only in a weakened host. So we're going to talk about a few different uh, people that I'd like you to know. So again, notice it's red. That's something you want to know. Uh, Robert Hooke is the first person to publish descriptions of cells. He actually uh, was the first person to use the term cell when describing uh, plants. Now, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, he actually refined microscopes. He was the first person to see bacteria. Now, back in the 16 and 1700s, uh, there were two theories out there that you should know. One was spontaneous generation, and that is that life comes from non-living things, and biogenesis, which is what we know to be true today, that life emerges from existing life. Someone to know also is Louis Pasteur. So he discovered microbes in the air. Now, we're going to be talking about him a lot uh, this semester. He did a lot of really cool things out there, pasteurization, uh, you may have heard of. We'll talk about later this semester. Uh, but he also developed the first vaccine against anthrax and rabies. So he's done a lot of different things. Now, the germ theory of disease states that microbe cause infectious diseases. And please know that Robert Koch showed that a specific microbe causes a specific disease. So that's what he's best known for. He actually dis, uh, worked with anthrax. Now, aseptic techniques are something we'll be talking about in labs and in lectures. And um, basically, that's sterile techniques. And that's something that uh, needs to be emphasized because back uh, in the early 1800s, aseptic technique was not used. So a person to know all again is Ignat Semmelweis, and he developed the first aseptic technique in a hospital setting. The other thing I want you to know about him is he's the first person to recommend hand washing. We know how important hand washing is, guys. So recommended hand washing to decrease mortality rates from childbed fever. So hand washing, Semmelweis. Joseph Lister, he's the first person who actually started sterilizing instruments and sanitizing wounds. They weren't doing that uh, again in the early 1800s. Now, most of you are going to be going into some kind of uh, healthcare environment, and aseptic processes, and those are sterile processes, guys, prevent healthcare acquired infections. And these are also known as nosocomial infections. So, things you should be doing, washing your hands, wearing gloves, sterilizing instrument, decontaminating surfaces. We're going to go through that throughout this semester and discuss why that's so important. We're also going to start talking about different types of microbes. So our prokaryotic microbes don't have a nucleus. Eukaryotic microbes have a distinct nucleus. So as the semester unfolds, we'll be talking more about uh, these types of organisms. Now, throughout the semester, you're going to see a lot of different uh, microbes, and they're all named in a specific way. So, our scientific names, guys, have what we call a binomial nomenclature. So, that's a two name. Remember, bi means two, two name system. First, we have a genus, and that would be the first name, and that's always capitalized. And then the species is the second name in lowercase. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that scientific names are italicized. So if it's not italicized, then it's not uh, a scientific name. So there's a lot of different ways that we categorize microbes, guys, and we have very broad uh, categories called domains down to specific ones called species. For the exam, I'd like you guys to know from the top to the bottom, the order from largest, the largest is domain, and the smallest is species. So what you want to know for your exam is that starting from the top, the largest is the domain, then the next is the kingdom, then the phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species would be the smallest then in this list. Please also know we have three domains. Two domains, bacteria and archaea, are prokaryotes, and eukarya would be eukaryotic types of organisms. So three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Now one of the things we'll be talking about a lot this semester is that microbes don't live in an isolated environment. They have uh, symbiotic relationships. So that's when two or more organisms are closely connected. These are three types of relationships that they can have. We can have parasitism, that will hurt the host, mutualism, which will help the host, and commensalism. And in that case, there's no perceived benefit or cost to the host. Biofilms are something we'll talk about a lot this semester. They are sticky communities made of single or diverse microbial species. And that'll be important later uh, when we talk about indwelling devices and things like that. So one of the things that the cells secrete, guys, is called a glycocalyx. So please know that the bacteria will produce this glycocalyx and it's a sticky outer layer. A glycocalyx is a sticky outer layer. That's what allows these microbes then to grow together in a community. We'll talk about normal microbiota. Uh, that's the stuff that we have growing in our bodies. They actually help to train our immune system, provide vitamins, help us digest food. Uh, so not everything, uh, every type of microbe out there is bad. We do have beneficial ones as well. And this slide just shows the variety. So we have a lot of different types of microbes in different parts of our body. Throughout the semester, we'll go into these a little bit more in detail. So when you have a patient and you want to know what their infection is, you first have to start to culture microbes. When we grow microbes in a variety of different ways, sometimes we grow them on a plate, sometimes we grow them in a liquid called broth, sometimes in auger uh, slants and deeps that are actually in tubes. And then one of the things that you want to do is isolate colonies. And colonies arise from a single cell. And that's because you want to see what's causing the infection. So if you look down here, these little dots, those are actually colonies. So again, a colony would be a group of cells that develop from a single parent cell. Now, if you have a mixed culture, you're going to see more than one characteristic. So you can see in this description, this kind of yellowish one, some white ones, some smaller ones, those all indicate you have more than one microbe on that plate. We'll be doing a lot of staining uh, exercises in the lab. And the first thing that you have to do before you stain is smear the specimen on there onto a slide. Then you fix it, usually by uh, exposing it to heat, and then you stain it. So we have different types of stains. So please know that we have basic dyes, and that a ba basic dye is positively charged. We also have acidic dyes. Please know that an acidic dye is negatively charged. Now, we use basic dyes primarily, guys, uh, in simple staining because bacteria have a negative charge. So our basic dye 
because it's positive, will be attracted to and stick to the bacteria that are negative. Mordants are chemicals that uh, will be used in a lot of things. They actually hold or enhance another type of dye. And we're gonna be talking about gram staining shortly. And iodine, please know, is the mordant in the gram stain. It holds crystal violet. It complexes with it. So a couple of different stains, guys. We have simple stains, and they just take on the color that you add. We have flagella stains, and you can see these little flagellas here. Those are things in the lab we'll cover in a lot more detail. Then we have differential staining. So the one that you're going to be responsible in lecture to know the steps for is the gram stain, but I'll mention acid fast as well. So first of all, gram stain classifies bacteria as either gram positive or negative. Gram positive will appear purple, please know that, and gram negative will appear pink. The steps of the gram stain, these are what you should also know. First of all, our primary stain is crystal violet. It will bind to both the gram-negative and positive cells. Then iodine is our mordant. It will form a crystal violet iodine complex. Now, we have an acetone alcohol, or what we call decolorizing step, that will rinse the sample. And then we can counter stain then with safranin. Safranin is a red dye uh, at the end. Now, throughout the semester, I'm going to have uh, take a screenshot and upload to the Dropbox for every chapter. So please make sure you take a picture of this and upload it to the Dropbox. So from this slide, what you want to know, guys, is what goes on in each step. So for the gram positive, when you add crystal violet, it stays purple because the color crystal violet is purple. purple and it will bind. In the next step, again in gram positive, you're gonna form a crystal violet iodine complex. It stays purple. When you add the acetone alcohol, it actually dehydrates and traps the crystal violet iodine so that at the end, gram positive stays purple because you've trapped that color in. For the gram negative, Again, you have crystal violet in the first step. It binds, stays purple. You have the iodine, forms the crystal violet iodine complex. Now, here's a big difference. Gram-negative cells have an outer membrane. It gets washed away. So the color washes out, so at this step, it's clear. Then we counter stain with safranin, and you'll see a pink color at the end. <clears throat> so, again, the gram-positive cell walls have thick layer of peptidoglycan, no outer membrane. Gram-negative have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, and they have an outer membrane. So, when you add the alcohol acetone again, guys, for gram-negative, dissolve the outer membrane, damage the peptidoglycan, which is very thin, wash out the crystal violet iodine. For the gram-positive, you slightly damage the peptidoglycan, but then you get dehydration and the crystal violet iodine is retained. Now for acid fast, the only thing you have to know is that acid fast bacteria have mycolic acid in their cell walls, and they will retain then the red color. Now, in your textbook, guys, there's a lot of information on microscopy. I'll cover that for those of you who are in the lab class. Uh, but for lecture, what I'd like you to know is the following. The ocular on the microscope, that's the eyepiece, that's what you look in, has a power of 10. Resolution is the clarity of an image. Refractive index is the degree to which a uh, substance bends light. So when we use what's called an oil immersion lens or a 100x objective, we use the oil to bend the light so that more light goes into the objective. And finally, total magnification is the power of the ocular times the power of the objective.
So again, guys, with oil immersion, you're using that to bend the light so that it goes into the objective lens.